This is the second episode in a two-part series, and the first story in a larger season. This season covers cases in New Mexico. All season, we're supporting the New Mexico nonprofit Angels Voices Silence No More. Please, be sure to listen through the end of the episode for information. This series discusses violence, homicide, crime scenes, autopsy, drug use, and suicide. If you or a loved one is struggling with suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255 or 911 if there is an immediate emergency or crisis. This is The Fall Line. Last time, we introduced you to Vanjie Randall Shorty, who works on behalf of many families of missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives in New Mexico and across the United States. She became involved with other activists after her son, Zachariah Juan Shorty, disappeared on July 21st, 2020. Zach was a lifelong resident of Kirtland, New Mexico, but spent time in nearby Farmington and on the Navajo reservation. When his family began their search for him, they looked everywhere, covering miles of city territory in their cars and rougher terrain crossed on four-wheelers. They worked in shifts and kept in contact with the local Farmington police. But though they heard rumors, there was no sign of Zach. Four days later, his body was found on the Navajo Nation Reservation in an area the Daily Times describes as, quote, on a dirt path in a field west of the Nanahazad Chapter House. A chapter is part of the governmental structure of the Navajo Nation and its most local form. But as Vanjie tells it, several more days passed before she was informed of Zach's death. And it's that excruciating passage of time that she still struggles to understand. Though to Vanjie's understanding, a number of agencies were either informed or involved, there seemed to have been a lack of communication between them. As we told you last episode, Zach grew up with his brother, sister, mother, and father. His siblings, Christian and Katrina, were several years older than him, but that did not affect their closeness. Zach especially looked up to Christian. Zach and his brother both loved football and video games, and they spent as much time together as they could. Christian supported Zach's dreams, too. Zach always loved music, and he dreamed of a successful career in hip-hop. Christian wanted to see his brother succeed in every way, and he promised that he'd be there to see Zach walk at his high school graduation. When Christian passed away during Zach's senior year, it wasn't just a horrible shock. It was a blow that he never fully recovered from. No one in the family did, but Vanjie was determined to be there for Zach and support him through his grief. Zach also had a girlfriend and a new baby daughter whom he loved very much, and he wanted to support his family. Zach worked around the Kirtland area with that goal in mind. And he kept pursuing his music, too. Even after his breakup with his girlfriend, Zach was still working and earning money for his family. And he still hoped that they'd get back together. But he was facing other issues, too. Vanjie tells us that starting in adolescence, Zach had issues with drugs and with alcohol. He'd spent some time in juvenile detention when he was a young teen, and Vanji hoped that that would be the end of his trouble with law enforcement. But in 2019, he was arrested for what the Farmington Times described as, quote, multiple drug trafficking charges for selling meth to an undercover agent. Vanji knew that Zach had substance use disorder, but not that he'd been involved in selling drugs. Over the next weeks, Zach was brought in at least twice to be interviewed by law enforcement. He told his mother that some of the individuals he spoke with were members of the drug task force. According to the Farmington Daily Times, Zach was eventually convicted and was sentenced to probation for that charge. Vanjie hoped that after that, he'd stay close to home. And Zach did for a while. He was scared, Vanjie told us. He went to work and he stayed at the house. But eventually, he grew restless. He started going to spend time with his friends at local motels, where they'd drink and they'd work on music. KB, a girl that Zach was seeing at the time, often went with him when he hung out at local motels. On the night that he disappeared, they'd spent most of the day at the Journey Inn, a motel in the nearby town of Farmington. Vanjie had seen him earlier that night. She'd brought KB there and dropped off some food for Zach and his friends. 
And she was concerned when she saw her son. When she arrived at the Journey Inn with his friend KB, Zach was visibly upset. He'd been crying on the phone with the mother of his daughter. Vanji heard some of the conversation. Zach was begging to get back together with his ex. He wanted to be a family again. Vanji counseled him. You know what you need to do, Zach. Get clean, get focused. She asked him to come home with her right then. They could work it out. He promised that he would come home later, but first he wanted to finish working on the music track that he'd started. He promised Vanji that he would be home that night. She left KB with him and his other friends and the journey in, and she fell asleep with her phone on the pillow in case Zach called her and needed a ride. But it wasn't Zach's call that awakened her. At around 11.30 p.m., his friend KB called Vanji's phone. Zach was missing. He'd walked out the door of their room at the Journey Inn to smoke a cigarette, but he had not taken his phone, and he hadn't returned. That worried Vanji the most. He always had his phone. If he'd been planning to leave the room for any longer than a few minutes, he would have taken it with him. She could not get a clear answer on how far his friends had searched, so she woke up Zach's dad, a dialysis patient who'd had a treatment that week, and they set out to look for him. Vanji and her husband left Kirtland, where they lived, and headed over to nearby Farmington to look for Zach. His dad and I took our vehicles. We went up to the journey, and I told her, stay there, because I'm going to pick you up. I picked her up, and um, we started driving around. There was a park that everybody hangs out in. And this is in July. This is summertime. So there are people out. This is a high traffic area for drug and alcohol users. So 11, 11.30 at night is early for these people. They are up and about until 3 a.m. walking those streets, riding their bikes or whatever, you know. So there was quite a bit of people still out. We walked the parks. I was calling out for Zach's name. We were driving up and down the streets. We drove from the Journey Inn back to Kirtland to the house. I don't know how many times throughout the night, checking the highways in case he was walking. It is not like Zach to not call me. Just like he did that afternoon, Zach would have done anything and everything to have called me. I didn't hear from him that whole night. I went home about 5 a.m. and I stayed home waiting for him to walk through the door. This was on Wednesday. Dad continued to search throughout the daytime. I have put up a Facebook post, you know, have you seen my baby boy? And started getting the word out, started making phone calls. Have you guys seen him? Have you seen him? No, everybody said, no, we haven't heard from him. So people were starting to, you know, to try to make contact with him. I had KB at the house with me. She was making some phone calls. I remember that. And I was calling around. Dad comes back late Wednesday evening, and I'm home all day. He never came home. So we switched out. I go out Wednesday night again with KB. She was the last person to see him. I went. We went out Wednesday night, drove around throughout the whole night again, got back home early Thursday morning. Dad went to dialysis Thursday morning. So I got home and... I made my cup of coffee and I'm sitting at the kitchen table, just staring out the window. And I'm like asking myself, what am I going to do? What do I do? I called non-emergency dispatch and told them I needed to make a missing persons report. And they connected me with an officer who took the report and was asking me all sorts of questions, like the color of his hair, the color of his eyes. What was he last wearing? Asking for descriptions of his tattoos and scars and dental records. And I just remember falling apart and asking them, why are you asking me this? You know, why? And, um... They take the report and they tell me we're going to get a missing persons report, a flyer, and you can pick it up by five. 
and they were going to put him on their website, their Farmington Police Department Facebook page. And they did that. And so um, I stayed home and Thursday, his dad came home. He, he was pretty drained from dialysis. And, you know, he still wanted to look. And he continued looking. I just stayed home waiting for Zach to come home. I got a phone call from Farmington PD and said that the flyers were ready. So I picked them up. And my first stop was the journey in. And I went from door to door. I knocked on each door asking everybody, have you seen Zach? I um, came across a few people who says they had seen him, that he had an altercation with another guy Monday night. By then, room 129 was empty. But two doors down off to the right, there was a guy standing there and his door was open. And he was very suspicious, you know, behavior. He said he saw Zach and just, you know, he didn't have any answers for me. But just his whole demeanor, it wasn't right. It was just, it was different. And um, I gave him the flyer and I left. I went home. By Friday, July 24th, Zach had been missing for three days and his family had no leads. Farmington had shared the information online and given them flyers, but as is the case with many missing adults, the larger community was unaware that he was missing at all. Vanjie and her husband's families decided to organize a large-scale search that would cover the terrain that they had not been able to cover in their cars. I didn't know where to look. I didn't know what to expect. I just knew that my baby was missing. Zach's friends also joined in door-to-door -door street canvassing of some of the local motels and areas where Zach was known to hang out, and they checked in with every local hospital and law enforcement agency that they could think of. At that point, Vanjie said, they began to search the less accessible areas around Farmington and beyond. We had gone through, like, weeds and woodsy area along the river, like I said, I didn't know what to do. And then one of my family members asked me, and I'll always remember that question. He asked me, are we looking for Zach or are we looking for a body? And I stopped and I said, we're looking for Zach. He says, why are we looking in these areas then? And I started driving up and down the highways again. And calling out his name, Juwan, where are you? You know, have you guys seen Zach? You know, I was yelling throughout neighborhoods, you know, Zach, just yelling as loud as I could. And we went home Friday with no answers. The family search continued into the weekend with no word, no official word at least. But Vanjie received a strange phone call from one of Zach's friends that she could not make sense of at the time. She and her family were out searching an area that Vanjie described to us as, quote, on the Navajo reservation off of N36, when a young woman called her. I get a phone call from another, the other female that was in the room that night. And so she calls. And she says, I heard Zach is gone. And I'm like, what? No, he's not. We're still searching. So I think she caught herself and she stopped. We now know that Zach's remains were discovered on Saturday, July 25th, 2020. According to the FOIA fulfillment we received from the New Mexico OMI, quote, his death was pronounced in San Juan County on 7-25-2020 at 1415 hours which is 2.15 p.m. Is it possible that Zach's friends heard that his body had been discovered and didn't want to be the ones to tell Vanjie? She just doesn't know. But at that time, to Vanjie's knowledge, Zach had not yet been positively identified. 
We know that he had been identified via fingerprint by the next day, Sunday, when his autopsy was performed. But on Saturday, Vanjie didn't know any of this. She was looking for her son, alive. The next part of the story is confusing, to Vanjie and to us. She still doesn't have answers about why it happened or what it meant, if anything, in relation to Zach's case. Vanjie says that she received communication from KB, the girl who Zach had been seeing on and off. And it was frightening. We regrouped because KB, by then she had gone off on her own. And she started messaging me through Facebook Messenger. And she was saying, help, help me. I've been kidnapped. I'm being held hostage. And, you know, please help me. And I'm like, what the heck, you know? I was like, well, then call the cops. And she's like, I can't. They're going to hurt me. You know, and so I was very suspicious of that. And I showed my family. They're like, no, let's call the cops because it could be a setup. So we made contact with Farmington PD. We met, she even gave me a pin location of where she was. So for one, if you're being held hostage, you wouldn't have your phone, you know? So we met down the street, the same street where she gave me her pin location in Farmington. We met there with the officer. I showed him the messages, told him that she was one of the individuals that was with Zach that night. Told him that we're looking for Zach. He's a missing person. The officer didn't know who Zach was and, you know, that he was a missing person. He comes across KB walking with her friend down the street. So he approaches her, says, are you so-and-so? She says, yes. He says, okay, are you okay? She says, yes. Why? You know, he says, well, you send a message that says you're being hosted. You're being held hostage. Are you being held against your will? She says, no, I'm not. So she's walking with her friend. Yeah. And he runs their ID. The friend ended up going to jail because she had a warrant. KB was released and let go. Vanji tells us that during this conversation, Zach's disappearance was not discussed. And she still does not have answers as to what went on with KB. She says that they have not spoken since then. We did not interview KB for this series, so we do not have her perspective on the events of that evening. We did reach out to law enforcement regarding Zach's case. Now the FBI is in charge of the investigation, so they are the point of contact. When we reached out to the FBI for comment, the regional Albuquerque office declined to comment, quote, out of respect for the ongoing investigation, but did want to confirm that a $10,000 reward is active in Zach's case. There's more information on that at the end of our episode. The family search continued throughout that weekend and into Monday, when they took ATVs out through some of the roughest terrain in the area. Vanjie was at home waiting for news when she got a phone call. This is from my brother-in-law, and he says, you need to call OMI. He says, they have Zach. And I call OMI. And tell them who I am. Tell them I'm looking for Zach, my baby. Do you have him? I'm told that you have him. And she says, yes, we have a body that fits the description, but we can't confirm because we have to run his fingerprints. And I'm like, how long is that going to take? And she says, well, We just got him, and I'm looking at him right now. I I don't know, and and I'm feeling nauseous. Without any answers, Vanjie and her husband began what would be an hours-long drive between agencies, trying to find out something. Dad and I drive into Farmington to the police station to see what is to see if we can get some answers, you know, and. By then, it's closed, and I'm walking around the police department, you know, knocking on doors, and a detective answered, 
And I tell her, you know, I need some answers. I just called OMI. Do you guys know anything? Again, the person I'm talking to doesn't even know Zach and doesn't even know he's missing. And she says, let me make some phone calls. Wait across the street in the parking lot. So we go across the street in the parking lot. And I don't know how many minutes went by. And I am just sitting there like it felt like forever. You know, I call OMI again. And I said, do you guys have any, do you have any answers for me? And she says, no, not yet. And I asked her, do you want me to drive to Albuquerque? Because I, I, I can drive down there to identify my son's body. She says, no, you know, no, you don't need to do that. Eventually, a local firefighter stopped by their car to see if Vanjie and her husband were okay. And when they explained what was happening, he made some calls for them. He promised that a detective would come by and speak with them in the morning. And he asked them to go home and try to get some rest. This is Monday evening. We get home and we don't know what to do. His dad was angry. I remember him leaving. I cried myself to sleep. His dad eventually came home. He woke me up. And I think he had been drinking. I just remember him sitting right up. He pulls up a chair, sits right in front of me, and he's in my face. He's angry and telling me it's my fault, you know. It's my fault. In the middle of all of that, my phone vibrates. I open the text message while he's yelling at me, tell him to stop. And and I'm reading a message, and it's a ransom message saying that they have Zach, and they want like $8,000 for him. Your son is sick, and he needs you, and don't you contact the police, or we're going to kill him. And I'm like, what in the world? So we he stops arguing with me. And we're focused on that on my phone now. And I didn't want to call because you can download the scanner. And I was afraid it would get out there. So we got in my car. We started driving around Kirtland midnight looking for a sheriff. We find one. I tell him of Zach again, Farmington PD, Sheriff's Department, which is county, no communication. That sheriff's deputy called the Farmington police and said that Vanjie and her husband should head to the police station to meet with authorities there. Vanjie tells us that they met an officer in the parking lot who took photos of the threatening messages that they'd received and who told them to come back in the morning. But they weren't sure what to do about the messages and the calls, which were still coming in nonstop. And they still didn't have any more information on Zach. We go home and... My phone is going just nonstop. And the guy is calling me. He switches from text and calls me. And he says, you know, asking me to get gift cards and things like that. And I'm like trying to buy time and because I have my appointment in the morning with the detective. This terrifying experience, it is not unique to Vanjie. We've heard from a number of family members who've gone through the same thing. When their loved one goes missing, a stranger, or even someone they know, will see a flyer or a social media post, and they'll take advantage. They'll pretend to have that loved one in the hopes of getting money out of a desperate family who just wants to see their member safe again. It's a scam designed to prey on some of the most vulnerable people out there, victims of crime in the midst of a crisis. And Vanjie had to sit and watch those calls and messages come in all night. Zach's family was facing so much conflicting information. What his uncle had heard, what they'd been told by the OMI, the ransom messages. So, on Tuesday morning, when they headed into Farmington, they had no idea what they'd be told. Vanjie remembers that each family member went upstairs, one by one, to speak with authorities. She remembers there being representatives from a few different departments present. 
my brother-in-law went in first. They questioned him. And I'm assuming it's because of the information he gave me about OMI. And then I was next. And I just remember the long table, police officers, Navajo Nation sitting on each side of the table over here on the side. And meanwhile, my phone is sitting on the table. It's ringing from the person doing the ransom calls. And I'm like, do you guys want to answer that? He's calling. And they said, no, no. They asked me, you know, what had happened because I was one of the last persons who saw Zach. You know, so I had to go back to Tuesday and, you know, give them my timeline up until that moment that I was sitting there. They asked if they could have my phone. I said, sure. They took my phone. I unlocked it. And they said, when we're done, we'll bring it to you or we'll call you. I said, okay. They said, go home and we'll be in contact with you. I leave there with no answers. They don't tell me anything about Zach. We go home. We wait at home because we don't know what else to do. Five o'clock, they come knocking on my door. There was the FBI agent, a victim's advocate, and the investigator. They came and I invited them in. We sat down at the table and they said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And confirm Zach's from his death and I just sat there you know you don't know what to say they gave me a pamphlet I asked him how where they wouldn't give me any answers he said I'm sorry it's under investigation we can't share that information with you to our knowledge, it's unclear who was making the ransom demands of Vanjie. When Vanjie and Zach's father informed their families of Zach's death, they didn't have the answers their loved ones needed, that they needed. Everyone had questions. They had to move on with plans for Zach's funeral while they waited for further word. By Thursday, I had picked out, you know, the funeral home and picked out his casket the mother of his child, of his daughter. She shopped for all of his clothing, his shoes. He picked out flowers. Zach used to tell me that he wanted to be near his brother. And um, I didn't pick the plot, but I went to go pay for it. And I just told him, his brother is Christian. This is where he's at. If you can get something as close to him as you can. The day of his funeral was the first time I went there. The hole was dug. I walked over there. And, oh, my God. So they're both in the same row. And they have one person between them. And that's how close they ended up. We had his funeral. And I felt like life was just on pause, you know. I requested for his um, death certificate. And that's where I had learned that he had died of gunshot wounds. As we said, we received Zach's autopsy report via FOIA request. And according to OMI records, his autopsy was completed on Sunday, July 26, 2020, two days before his family was officially informed of his death. And he was identified via fingerprint. According to the report, Zach died of, quote, seven gunshot wounds at indeterminate range. It was different areas of his body, front and back, which tells me that they took him out there and they made sure that he suffered. They made sure my baby suffered from his injuries and that kills me inside. And Zach and I had a close connection and I often wonder what his last memories were. Did he call out for his mom? I didn't know where they found him. I took it upon myself to find where they found him. I was determined to find a location. He was last seen at the Journey Inn in Farmington. 
room 129. He was taken through Kirtland or even on the back side of Kirtland. We have the Navajo Reservation just right outside of Kirtland, which is about five minutes away from here. And it's called Nananzad. It's a little community. And they took him there. They took him down below where there's a field uh, near the river. And they shot him to death there. I located the landowners. I went from house to house. And there was a vehicle driving as I was going to the next house. Driving, you know, coming across my path. And I waved, shined my lights, and the, they stopped. I told him who I was and, you know, who Zach was. He says, my daughter's the one that found found your son. It was raining during those couple of days. His daughter goes jogging, and she hadn't run in a few days. She went running and came across him from a distant the field that he was found on, like it was blocked off, but people cut the fence down and they drive through there and they party near the river. So it's a party spot. So the person who took him there knew of the location. They were familiar with the location. It's not something that you're going to stumble upon, you know. And Daughter didn't approach Zach. She turned around. She thought maybe he was passed out. She ran back home. Dad sent his son down there. Son approached Zach and saw that he was gone and made the phone call. I took jugs of water. I poured the water on so the blood could go back into the ground. <laughs> I collected river rocks because it was on the dirt road. I didn't want anybody else driving over. And I put the fence around, around it. Put the flowers there. I had nightmares after that for a while because of the location up on top of the mesa there just right up above the river. There's businesses, there's homes off to the left. On the other side of the fields, there's homes. How can you not hear gunshots go off? Since 2020, there have been a number of agencies involved in Zach's case. In our first episode covering his death, we quoted an article from Source New Mexico that highlighted the roadblocks that Vangie has faced. The same roadblocks that many other families of missing and murdered indigenous persons encounter when pursuing justice. A complex web of jurisdictions and questions as to who has charge of a case and whether communication is occurring. She felt that early on, when she saw a lack of interagency communication regarding Zach's missing persons case. As Source New Mexico wrote in 2023 of Zach, quote, he lived in Kirtland, New Mexico, was last seen in San Juan County, and his body was found on the Navajo Nation. That meant that, in her attempts to find answers, Vangie, quote, entered the maze of law enforcement, contacting local police, the county sheriff, and tribal police, before being told that the FBI took on the case. Now, we know that information is not always freely available in an active case. But Vanjie herself was receiving information and trying to share it with authorities. She feels that the people who were at the Journey Inn that night may know more about Zach's disappearance and maybe his death too, because she got, quote, messages through Facebook, leads, and names. She told us, quote, she would screenshot them and email them to the FBI agent. They haven't arrested anybody. And it's been frustrating because I, all my FBI agent ever told me was, well, Zach knew a lot of people. Zach knew a lot of people, you know, because of the drug world. And 
we have to have probable cause to question them. Hello, my Zach is dead. How much do you need, you know, like to bring a person in? And I just, I feel like the individuals who did this to him, I say individuals because Zach wouldn't have just gotten in in a vehicle with somebody. He would have put up a fight. I've had people confess names of the individuals who had confessed to taking Zach's life, given those names to the FBI agent. Nothing's been done. Some of them are incarcerated right now for other charges because I see them on the Farmington um, arrest site. So I'm like emailing them. So-and-so is in jail right now. You might want to get over there and question them. I don't know if anything was followed upon, you know. Vanjie agrees that Zach's death is likely tied into, as she said, quote, the drug world. But there's one thing that he told her before he died that she keeps coming back to. Allegedly, Zach worked in some capacity to inform on illegal activities after his first arrest. Vanjie wonders if his death could be related to this perhaps as a form of retribution. This is not something that we can verify with official sources. As we said, comment was declined due to active investigation, and policy generally dictates that confidential informant status is not discussed. But Vanjie says that Zach discussed this with her. I have that relationship with Zach where he could tell me anything. And I begged him, I begged him not to do it. I said, don't do it. He says, no, mom, no, you know, I I got myself into this mess. And so he became, I guess, an informant. Zach told Vanjie a number of stories of activities he alleged were undertaken as part of his role as confidential informant. And Vanjie believes there are at least one or two of his friends who knew about this. If that information spread, she thinks it could have led to direct retribution against him. That's both frightening and heartbreaking because Vanjie knew Zach's inner circle well. My doors were open to his friends. I provided them a safe place. I provided them food because I didn't want them out on the streets. You know, I'm a mom. I wouldn't want my baby out there. I want him to be taken care of just like I take care of their children, you know. But apparently our mindsets are different. Zach knew them too, you know, because he worked for them, obviously. I think back to, I knew these people and not one of them came to his funeral. Not one of them gave their condolences to me, you know, and I just, it makes me mad. It honestly pisses me off, you know, where is the loyalty He would come home and he'd say, you know, mom, so-and-so got kicked out. They need a place to stay. Can they stay? And I said, yeah, sure, you know, but I don't want you guys drinking. I don't want you doing drugs in here. You know, he, and, you know, I, I got to know his friends. I, I knew who, who he hung out with. I knew his friends. I knew of the work that he did after he had done it. And I would get after him about it. Like, you know, you don't want to get caught up in that. I tried to protect him. I tried to protect him. I tried to save him. And I still lost him. For some months, Vanjie felt alone in her efforts to advocate for Zach. But then she began to connect with other families, both those affected by gun violence, like the members of ROBBED, Robbed, an Albuquerque area organization demanding change, and the larger MMIWR-MMIP movement. She began to attend vigils, marches, and meetings to speak about Zach, but also to act on behalf of other families and their loved ones. She recalled one major event focused on the disappearance of Pepita Redhair. Pepita disappeared from Albuquerque, New Mexico on March 24, 2020. I joined uh, my first walk in March 
for Papita. They were doing, and that's with the MMIW, with the Missing Murdered Indigenous Women. I joined that, and, you know, I, I didn't know what to expect. Like, I had no idea. They were holding signs of their loved ones, demanding answers, demanding justice. They would each all took turns going up on the stage. They had poster boards of their family members. They were sharing their stories. You know, and that's when I realized I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone. I was not the only one trying to seek answers, you know. And that's what started my journey in advocating for Zach. And I planned my first march here in Farmington, I believe it was a year later. And it wasn't. It was maybe October. I did a march and a walk from the journey in to Berg Park. And just demanding answers. My mentality was, somebody hurt my baby. That's all I kept thinking. Somebody hurt my baby. I wasn't going to let them get away with it. You know, you mess with the wrong kid. And, you know, I, I had a good group of supporters and I was very surprised by those that came out and and walked with me. As I became more and more involved, I started driving to Albuquerque and to Santa Fe more. You know, sitting in on house bills, you know, trying to get laws changed, meeting with the governor, meeting with the attorney general, meeting with the FBI agents doing what I could to, to get answers and, you know, get Zach's case solved. I found out in October during the missing persons day in Window Rock on the reservation that Zach had a new FBI agent on the case. So again, lack of communication. My old FBI agent didn't call me to say, Hey, I'm leaving. You know, this is going to be who's working on your case now. You want to come in and meet? Nope. I found out when I went to that event. And so I made contact. I was like, I want to know who this person is. I was finally able to sit down with this person in January of this year to make a connection. I told him, you know, I'm not backing down on the case. I and he says, you know, you know, I, I'm aware of that. I know that you're constantly calling. I was like, yes. We also have the um, task force, the missing murder task force. They were all willing to come and help the FBI agent. FBI said, no, we, we got it. We can handle the case, you know. So my new agent, you know, I've been praying for him like, okay, new eyes, new ears, just praying that he continues to focus on Zach's case. It's going to be four years next month. I just continued praying, you know, that we're going to get answers. I feel it in my heart that we're close. And I, I talk to him every day, talk to my baby every day. I visit the cemetery every holiday birthdays, Mother's Day. It really does hurt. I hurt for his daughter, but she knows what an amazing dad Zach was. She um, draws pictures for him. She paints little things for him. She takes flowers to him all the time. She's always going to remember, and she's always going to know who her daddy is. And you know, I think that's very important. And I truly am thankful to her mom for continuing to share those memories. And dad and I are, are no longer together. We went through a divorce after after Zach. You know, it, I, I left him the house. I gave him everything. I just, I walked away. Death changes, changes a person, you know, and... Zach is the one that kept us together. 
We had problems throughout our marriage, but I hung in there for my children. As a parent, you just, you, you know, you want what's best for the kids. You know, put you put your feelings aside, your emotions, everything. And I think there was a lot of blame as well between the two of us. And um, we didn't talk for a while until this year, actually. I think in our own ways, we needed to heal. And um, it's kind of funny that we made the connection again on our what would have been our 25th anniversary, April 17. And um, Dad and I have been talking since and just open with communication, you know. And I think we are moving forward together, not as a couple, but as sex parents with our healing journey. We still have our daughter and five grandchildren that we're raising together. And, you know, we talk and we cry together. We laugh. We talk about Zach. He came to our May 5th event this year, which was his first time. And he um, sat at the booth and watched what I, what I do, how I advocate for Zach. And just hearing those words of encouragement, because he can't do it, you know, of his health. Just hearing those words of encouragement, you know, that means a lot to me. And he tells me not to give up, and I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep fighting. You know, I may not get the answers, but I think that helping other families as well during this journey has is also my own healing part of it in the end i'm so glad that he chose me to be his mom and i'd do it all over again i would also choose his dad and here i am still fighting for answers still fighting for justice i'm his voice now i'm his voice through his music, Zach used to tell me, everybody's going to know Zach Shorty. Everybody knows Zach Shorty. So now I host events to help other families speak up about their, their loved ones in hopes to find their loved ones or to get justice for their loved ones. So May 5th, I rent the pavilion at Berg Park. I share the platform with other families now. So I not only advocate for Zach, but I I help other families so that they could be the voice of their loved ones. In 2021, Vanji interviewed with local New Mexico TV station KOAT7 to discuss Zach's case. She explained that, quote, in her fight for answers, there's one thing that she has now that she didn't before. She told reporters, I have a new family now, and that's the women here. They are my strength, and they're my support. And we're going to continue. We're going to continue. But Vanji needs your help. What you can do right now is go to our website and social media to get Zach's FBI flyer and share it across your social media network. That is a first step. You can also follow Vanji's official Facebook page, where she provides updates and action items on Zach's case. It's called Justice for Zachariah, My Mom is My Voice. And there's a link in our show notes, so you can go follow right now. The FBI is offering a reward of up to $10,000 for information leading to the identification, arrest, and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for the death of Zachariah Juwan Shorty. If you have information in Zach's case, call the FBI at 505-889-1300 or submit information online at tips.fbi.gov. Next time on The Fall Line, the disappearance of Melissa Montoya, who was last seen on St. Patrick's Day 2001. Her case galvanized a lawyer, Darlene Gomez, to advocate for the missing and murdered of New Mexico and to fight for better coverage, deeper investigation, and resolution in their cases. 
If you know of a case that should be covered on the fall line, there's a link to our case submission form in the show notes. Thank you for listening. This season, we're supporting Angels Voices Silence No More, a New Mexico-based nonprofit founded by our friend Eric Carter Londine, the brother of Jacob Londine. According to their mission statement, AVSNM's goal is to, quote, empower families by providing them with the necessary resources and referrals to advocate for their missing or murdered loved ones. We believe in taking a comprehensive approach to support, encompassing a wide range of services, including billboards, DNA testing, private investigation, funeral expenses, therapy, and much more. Our goal is to ensure that no family faces these challenges alone. Fall Line listeners can join us in donating to that mission. If you can't donate right now, that's okay. Sharing their charitable initiatives would be a huge help. You can find all the relevant links in our show notes. The Fall Line is an independent podcast, and we appreciate listener support. It allows us to do research, obtain FOIA, pay our content advisors, and support and donate to the causes we care about. If you try out the products we advertise, please use our sponsor codes. It really helps. And please take a moment to rate and review our show in your podcast app of choice. My book, Lay Them to Rest, which covers years of my life working on a Jane Doe case and the world of forensic scientists who resolve unidentified person cases is out everywhere as hardcover, ebook, and audiobook read by me. You can order it anywhere you get books and through your local library. Find out more through the link in our show notes. And if you'd like to support the show and the stories we cover, join us on Apple Premium or Patreon. 100% of our Patreon and Apple Premium earnings are supporting our Family Therapy Fund and actively paying for therapy for families who've appeared on the show. On Patreon, you can get early release, ad-free versions of our regular episodes for $5 a month. If you prefer Apple Premium, you can subscribe there as well. On Patreon, we also post occasional giveaways, updates, and blogs, which all patrons can enjoy, starting at just a dollar. The Fall Line is written, hosted, and researched by Laura Norton. Interviews by Brooke Hargrove. Produced, engineered, and scored by Maura Curry. Content advisement by Brandy C. Williams and Vic Kennedy. And, as always, our most special thanks to Liz Lipka. Mm-hmm.